So this is uh, session three, which is metabesity, uh, relationship to cancer. I apologize, have a, I've had a bad cold. I will speak slowly so that you can hear me. But I look forward to this being an exciting panel. We have Jennifer Leichelbel from Harvard, myself and Guido. And this will take about 40 minutes. And we're looking for heavy Q&A involvement from the audience. So uh, Jennifer is incredibly distinguished. She, she's director of the Leonard P. Zakim Center for Integrative Therapies and Healthy Living at Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. She's director of the, for the Center of Wellbeing, senior physician and associate professor of medicine at the Harvard Medical School. She's an internationally recognized speaker she has abundant peer review publications, most highly cited. She's had a very distinguished career, starting essentially at Wash U with most of her career in Massachusetts. In 2004, she was awarded an ASCO Career Development Award, and then at essentially a remarkably young age, became one of the fellows of ASCO last year, which is a very distinguished club. So I'm delighted to have uh, uh, Jennifer on board, delighted to have two such eminent colleagues on the panel. And so if we can start with my slides, that would be wonderful. So I'm taking a slightly different tack. Um, I was always taught by Sir James Black to stick to your center of excellence. So much of my life has been trying to identify the earliest drivers in order to facilitate prevention. Uh, but, next, but I'm going to start on the more conventional route. Um, Guido and the previous people have mentioned obesity. I'm going to mention the glycolytic switch from aerobic to anaerobic. Uh, metabolism. Guido has also privately mentioned smoking. I'm going to be talking about targeting multiple driver processes and then end up with the early detection of cancer at the single few cell stage. Next. So this is a wonderful study. We've been talking about rapamycin and metformin all, mo all morning. And Guido, I'm almost laughing because if you go into PubMed and put in autophagy, all you see is references to mTOR, which of course targets, is targeted by rapamycin. So it's totally convergent with your toxo. Um, so this is a multi-center uh, uh, phase three randomized double blind placebo-controlled trial. This is metformin early stage breast cancer. This is written, written by one of the key dominant intellectual drivers, Pam Goodwin, and it was done in concert with the National Cancer Institute of Cancer. In fact, it's called the MA32. Next trial. And this is the study design postmenopausal T1, T3. So this is a pretty early stage. T1, T3 and N0 to 3 is early, non-metastatic. And then on the left-hand side is the education arm. And then on the right is the education plus telephone base loss uh, intervention. Perhaps I've got the wrong slide here. Perhaps this is the... Uh, this is just a tell of the vein boost uh, intervention, but this was followed by a 5,000 patient randomized study with metformin. And I will ask Jennifer to comment on that. Next. 
So this is looking, this is a company which, believe it or not, I started uh, 14 years ago. Uh, it was called Darwin Pharma, as you can see at the bottom, and it looked at the role of sugars in cancer. Next. So this is from a clinician's point of view who treats cancer patients all the time. Glucose metabolism already forms the basis of the FTG PET scan. FTG is avidly taken up by most tumors, which is critical. Its utilization by tumor cells is increasingly being used as an early biomarker for late clinical response. And now glucose, sugars, rapidly becoming the cornerstone of early diagnostics. Next. I'm going to skip over this slide, but I just want you to look at the bottom on what is going to be a common theme in this conference. Imatinib targets abnormal tyrosine kinase, resulting in inhibition of ATP production. Next. So this is the last detailed slide here. Malignant tumors synthesize glucose at high rates in order to synthesize high levels of ATP necessary for rapid cell growth. This can occur in two ways, glycolysis and oxidative phosphorylation, which is what we normally use. Cancer cells exhibit high glycolytic phenotype. Over 50% of the ATP produced in tumor cells via by, uh, by glycolysis via 10% in normal cells. Existing high glycolytic rate within tumors may double due to low oxygen availability within the tumor mass and inhibition of ATP production via both routes results in rapid cell death. Next. So now I'm going to flip on to point number two, which is smoking. And this is wonderful work, basically, I think it was about 90 years of work from Sir Richard Dahl and Sir Richard Pito at Oxford. Um, it was basically Dahl first, Dahl and Pito, and then Pito continued after Dahl's death. And this is essentially um, an autobiography on Dahl's life. It was published, I think, in the in the shortly after his death. So Dahl and Pito listed cigarette smoking as the major single preventable cause of cancer in the United States, estimating that cigarette smoking accounted for about 30% of all cancer deaths in 1978. The overall estimate took into account all the usual factors, um, and then added numbers across cancer site, yielding estimates that 43% of all cancer deaths among men and 15% of women and 30% overall were because of tobacco smoking. So I will end this section by just saying, if we were to control three simple points, glucose intake, obesity. Number two, totally stopping smoking and just add a third one, which is sunlight without at least SPF 40 cream. Melanoma rates in Australia are 20 fold what they are in Northern Canada. So just those three simple public health, health measures would have a major impact on aging and incidence of cancer today. This is just like COVID-19. It's simple, stupid. Wear a mask, socially distance, perform proper hygiene. The two things are very similar. And one of the things I want to ask Guido and Jennifer is how we make full implementation of these obvious steps in reducing aging and death. Next. Point number three, sorry, it's a bit blurred, um, hitting multiple markers, and Guido partially referred to this himself. This is Hannah Hannah Weinberg from 2011. There was an original version in 20, 
in 2001. Next. Next. And this is a company which I'm working with, which is dealing with seven agents. One of them is metronomic cyclophosphamide at a low dose, which can be given um, basically to normal people. Um, the second, and then it's got three compounds in there. Uh, I've been asked not to reveal too much, but one of them, of course, is metformin. And then it's got three essentially nutrients in here. This is a total oral, which you take three times a day, and it targets angiogenesis, apoptosis, cellular metabolism. Next. I'm going to go through these pretty quickly. And there's immune surveillance and cancer stem cells. So it was just a comment that we need to hit multiple processes. The next. So just a reminder, cancer basically starts with an alteration in one cell. Within three, two weeks, it, can, it moves into about three at least subclonal populations. So the purple here can be B53, P, 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 P the green can be HER2, the uh, white in the middle can be PEC3CA, and it rapidly evolves from that point on. So it's critical to hit multiple targets. Next. So this is Darwinian cancer evolution. This is actually looking at uh, Nick's work out of London and showing how when you start with a primary tumor, and I hate to say this, but treatment provokes cancer evolution and it rapidly evolves to a point where it's to almost totally different from the original tumor. Next. So this is my last slide. You'll be relieved, Zan. And so this is basically looking at cancer de detection. So radiological detection is on the right. If we go back 7.9 months, then we can see ctDNA uh, a detection. But as Charlie Swanton has, has pointed out, we can only do that when the tumor mass is one centimeter. Now we are looking in this tiny company at the earlier stages. When you get a cancer, the cells around it change in sympathy and provoke an immune response. And so we can probably pick this up on a protein panel in the blood 12 months before you can pick it up on ctDNA. And I think this is going to be critical. This is my last sentence. One can run this test on a routine annual physical on a few drops of blood for only $50. And I think that's going to be a game changer. I'm hoping to implement this into routine annual physical exams before I pass. All right, thank you very much indeed. I will now hand the panel over to Jennifer. Uh, thank you so much. And, uh, and then after that, we will have a panel discussion, which I will gently uh, lead uh, my brilliant colleagues, and then we'll open it up to Q&A. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Brian, and thank you to all of the uh, organizers of this meeting who invited me here today to talk about obesity and cancer. If you could go to the next slide, please. I wanted to take a bit of a step back and talk about the observational evidence linking obesity to malignancy, to really think about why are we talking about obesity and cancer? So the observational evidence is consistent and clear that excess adiposity increases an individual's risk of developing malignancy. There are more than a thousand studies now that have looked at the relationship between body mass index, waist hip ratio, body weight, and the risk of developing cancer. The International Agency for Research in Cancer convened a panel to review the evidence linking obesity to cancer risk 
in 2015 and determined that there was a clear and consistent database linking obesity to the risk of more than a dozen malignancies. You advance, please. These cancers include common malignancies such as colorectal cancer, postmenopausal breast cancer, endometrial cancer. The World Cancer Research Fund independently reviewed the same data a few years later and came up with an almost identical list of malignancies for which there is a clear increase in risk with increasing body weight. Advance the next slide, please. Now we recognize that the prevalence of obesity is growing, not just in the United States, but around the world. And this has had a significant impact on cancer rates around the world. In 2012, obesity was responsible for about 3.6% of all cancers worldwide. This equates to almost 500,000 cancer cases directly attributable to obesity in that year alone. Obesity is responsible for almost 2% of cancers in men and about 5.5% of cancers in women. If you go advance, please. The number of malignancies that are attributable to obesity varies greatly around the world based on the prevalence of obesity in the population, other comorbidities, but you can see that in 2012, obesity accounted for about 111,000 cases of new cancer in North America alone, 70,000 new cases of cancer in East Asia, about 66,000 cases in Eastern Europe, and 58,000 cases of cancer in Western Europe. If you go to the advance, please. Now the impact of obesity on cancer is different in men and women. And some of this has to do with the interaction with smoking, which we just heard about. Um, in men, if you, I'm sorry for all of the animation, but if you advance just twice, please, for me. In men, obesity accounts for up to about 5% of new cancer cases in the places where the relationship between obesity and cancer is strongest. And that's places like North America, um, Australia, in women, obesity is directly responsible for almost 13% of new cancer cases in places like North America and Russia. Obesity is poised over the next decade to become the number one preventable cause of malignancy in the United States. And there are several other countries around the world where obesity will also surpass tobacco over the coming decades in terms of being the number one preventable cause of cancer. If you advance, please. Now we recognize that obesity not only impacts the risk of developing malignancy, it may also be impacting the timing of the onset of malignancy. Colorectal cancer was once a relatively rare malignancy in individuals under the age of 50. But over the last decades in the United States, the incidence of colorectal cancer in individuals under age 50 has been increasing by one to 3% each year. This is likely of multifactorial origin, but if you advance, please. But this is at least in part due to the increasing prevalence of obesity in young adults in the United States. Advance again, please. In this work by my colleagues at Dana-Farber, they found that the incidence of colorectal cancer in individuals under 50 was almost twofold in individuals with obesity as compared to individuals of normal body weight. So obesity appears to not only be impacting overall risk of cancer, but also may be increasing cancer rates in young adults. If you advance to the next slide, please. We also recognize that obesity not only increases the risk of developing malignancy, but also the risk of dying from malignancy in cancers which may otherwise be curable. In breast cancer, about 80% of women who are diagnosed with the disease ultimately survive it, but 20% die from breast cancer each year. We found that individuals with obesity at the time of breast cancer diagnosis have a significantly higher risk of dying from breast cancer compared to women of normal body weight. This meta-analysis conducted by the World Cancer Research Fund found that there was a 35% higher risk specifically of breast cancer-related mortality in women with obesity at the time of breast cancer diagnosis compared to women of normal body weight. Advance to the next slide, please. So obesity clearly increases the risk of developing and dying from malignancy, and the prevalence of obesity is rising. 
So the burning public health question is, can we modify this relationship? Can we lower cancer rates and improve cancer outcomes by helping individuals to lose weight? Advance to the next slide, please. The strongest evidence that weight loss could reduce the risk of malignancy comes from bariatric surgery studies. It's important to recognize that these are not randomized trials, but rather prospective observational cohorts where individuals who undergo bariatric surgery are matched by BMI, age, gender, and comorbidity index to individuals who do not undergo the procedure. At this point, we have several cohorts that have followed patients for many years, and they demonstrate that individuals who undergo bariatric surgery are at significantly lower risk of developing malignancy in the ensuing years compared to matched controls. This recent meta-analysis published last year of some of the largest cohorts suggested an almost 40% reduction in the risk of malignancy in individuals who underwent bariatric surgery. Advance, please. Looking specifically at some of these cohorts that have had longer term follow up, this was a study that was published by the Kaiser Group in 2017 of 22,000 individuals who underwent bariatric surgery and 66,000 matched controls. Advance, please. The investigators found first that overall, individuals who underwent bariatric surgery were at about 40% lower risk of malignancy compared to individuals who did not. Advance, please. They also demonstrated a significantly lower risk of individual cancers, such as colorectal cancer, endometrial cancer, advance please, pancreatic cancer, which is a malignancy which unfortunately carries a very dire prognosis in many settings. The risk of pancreatic cancer was reduced by almost 50% in individuals who underwent bariatric surgery, as well as a significant reduction in the risk of postmenopausal breast cancer. These data are provocative, but it's difficult to really draw cause and effect conclusions given the non-randomized nature of these studies. If you advance, please. However, there are a number of randomized trials that are currently ongoing, not looking at the impact of weight loss and cancer prevention, but looking at the impact of weight loss after cancer diagnosis on disease outcomes. The largest of these studies is the Breast Cancer Weight Loss, or BWELL trial. This is a trial that we are conducting in the United States and Canada, enrolling women with stage two and three breast cancer who have a body mass index of at least 27 kilograms per meter squared after diagnosis. Women are being randomized to a two-year telephone-based weight loss program plus health education or health education alone. Our primary outcome, if you advance please, is looking at the impact of this intervention on disease recurrence and subsequent mortality in these women with early breast cancer. Next slide, please. The study has been ongoing now for four years and we have almost completed our enrollment of the 3,136 women who will take part in this study. We have more than a thousand sites who've enrolling, who are enrolling patients across the United States and Canada. And over the next years, we hope to have definitive information of whether weight loss can alter disease trajectories after breast cancer diagnosis. I'm very hopeful uh, that these observational data really help add to all the mechanistic data from my colleagues in helping us to understand the relationship between obesity and cancer. And I think we'll turn this over now to the panel uh, to really get at some of the questions from the audience. Uh, Guido, I believe that you, do you have some comments for the cancer panel? You're on mute, Guido, I'm sorry. Uh, I actually have some slides uh, that I sent in. Okay, so Super. thank you so much. So I will follow up my, my previous talk um, and uh, use uh, the argument that autophagy induction, which is an anti-obesity measure, is actually useful for cancer treatment and maybe also cancer prevention. So if I go to the next slide, it's just a, uh, an introduction. Please move three forward, yes, and one more. So I already showed a similar slide before, but it, 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 this one illustrates a slightly different point of view. So the link between therapeutic success and interventional cancer, even for chemotherapy and radiotherapy, which are of course widely used for the 
primary treatment of cancer is uh, that all treatments that work have actually the ability to induce anti-cancer immune response. So this is um, the most important uh, mode of action in contrast to what has been believed in the past. And one of the mechanisms that is uh, coming into action is uh, the uh, induction of what is called immunogenic cell death. So the way how you kill cancer cells, of course it's important to kill them, but the way how you kill them is causing an immunogenic uh, uh, reaction and hence uh, uh, long-term memory response of T lymphocytes against tumor-associated antigens. So the next slide, uh, can you go uh, free for forward? Thanks, yes. Uh, this is one that I showed already previously. So this is the uh, search for caloric restriction mimetics as autophagy inducers, for which I told you that they have a positive impact on health span and lifespan, but also as a site observation, oncopreventive effect. And actually it turns out that they also may improve the efficacy of cancer treatments. And so if we move to the next slide, uh, and uh, next please, um, there is a common biomarker and a common mechanistic uh, interaction, which is uh, the phosphorylation of one particular protein, EIF2-alpha that has to be induced for autophagy to be kicked off in cells. And that is also required for the endoplasmic reticulum stress response that is involved in immunogenic cell death, ICD. And so there are two facets of uh, uh, lifespan prevention by autophagy induction and therapeutic responses to anti-cancer agents that come together, and next slide please, can be exploited um, to uh, look for biomarkers. So for instance, if we diagnose within the tumor signs of an anti-cancer immune response, so the presence of activated functional T cells and the presence of autophagic cancer cells together with the phosphorylation of EF2 alpha within the cancer cells, we can predict uh, 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 an ongoing immune response uh, and we can uh, uh, say that uh, uh, the patient's uh, chances to survive are relatively elevated. And this has been found for individual cancers, including breast cancer, ovarian carcinoma, AML, acute myeloid leukemia, and even a meta-analysis of all cancers. So um, the next slide is a totally experimental uh, slide. Uh, can you go on one further, uh, which is uh, next? Uh, Next, uh, so if we combine caloric restriction mimetics and immunogenic cell death inducers, we actually uh, obtain an improved outcome. So uh, for instance, chemotherapy in blue alone will reduce tumor growth uh, modestly. Uh, caloric restriction mimetics have no effect on their own, but if you combine them, uh, the yellow line you get a very nice effect that, by the way, is immune dependent because if you neutralize the dendritic cells or T cells, uh, you will not get such a therapeutic response. The next slide, please. Um, uh, uh, you can show this also by depleting T cells. So, so CD8 positive T cells are required for the combination effect of caloric restriction mimetics and immunogenic cell death to uh, 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 control tumors. And next slide, please. Uh, we can actually uh, be even more fashionable and combine these two uh, inducers of autophagy, caloric restriction mimetics, and immunogenic cell death, ICD, with immune checkpoint inhibitors uh, uh, neutralizing PD-1 and or CTLA-4. And if we do this uh, in an, several animal models, next slide, please, we get uh, uh, the the possibility to cure mice permanently from established tumors. So it is the triple combination of multiple interventions uh, that you have been mentioning, Brian, in a way, that is uh, giving a very major effect uh, at, uh, as, against these experimental tumors. And next slide, please. Um, uh, just go ahead, one, one more slide, um, uh, one more. We will skip this one, uh, one more. Uh, so the mechanism of action of these uh, caloric restriction mimetics together with uh, 
chemotherapeutic agents and or immune checkpoint inhibitors is that they have to induce autophagy in the tumor cells. So if we inactivate the autophagic program, we lose the efficacy of the treatment. If we inhibit autophagy in the immune system, we get a modest inhibition. So there's probably an action on the malignant cells that is uh, primordial. We see this effect for uh, several dozens of different agents uh, that we tested, including, for instance, for spermidine, which in uh, uh, epidemiological observations is a uh, uh, an enhanced spermidine uptake with nutrition in humans is a, uh, as true for aspirin, by the way, as well, is a sign of or, uh, or correlates with a reduction of uh, uh, the risk of developing cancer overall uh, by about 30% uh, uh, for spermidine and uh, 10 to 15% of aspirin. And these are actually caloric restriction mimetics that uh, induce autophagy by acting on uh, a particular acetyltransferase. And next slide, please. Uh, next, uh, we will skip this one in the interest of time. Uh, so, uh, uh, we uh, can you go? Uh, can you put off the slides? So, to summarize, uh, there are therapeutic interventions that are being treated uh, tested in mice. Uh, it is already a, a clinical reality to combine caloric restriction mimetics uh, with uh, uh, immune, uh, with uh, chemotherapies to some extent, much more fashionable as right now, because there are several hundreds of trials ongoing to combine PD-1 or PDL one blockade with uh, immunogenic chemotherapeutics. And there are signals that this works in breast cancer and in uh, kidney cancer, among others. And uh, the future will tell whether the triple combination that I showed in mice uh, with uh, autophagy inducers will be successful in humans as well. So it is interesting that uh, a therapeutic intervention that has an anti-obesity effect uh, has an anti-cancer effect as well. Thank you for your attention. Many years of strategy and work behind this. So. Just stunning. So, Zan, we're limited on time. We've got about eight minutes. Um, sorry, turning off the phone. Zan, we've got about eight minutes. Uh, can you see me? We can see you, Brian. Would okay. you like to go we've to got some about questions? Eight more minutes. I was going to ask three quick questions to the faculty and then open up to Q and A. Is that good? Great. Please. All right. Number one, Jennifer, you are repeating head of the center for integrative therapies and healthy living and director for the center for faculty well-being can i just ask as somebody running these centers what are the standard recommendations you give to every patient that comes in so that you can guide us clinicians certainly so there are a number of groups that uh, produce guidelines for nutrition physical activity and weight management for cancer patients um, the World uh, Cancer Research Fund, I think, has probably the best cancer prevention guidelines that are out there. They're very comprehensive. That was part of their third expert report that was published about a year and a half ago. The American Cancer Society also recently updated their guidelines for cancer prevention last summer. Um, for most of our patients already have malignancy since this, uh, our center is embedded within our cancer center. And I think the guidelines that we usually lean upon there are the American Cancer Society and the American College of Sports Medicine. I will say that ASCO is working on some guidelines for nutrition and weight management, physical activity during cancer treatment, which right now there's a bit of a gap for what people should actually be doing during the time that they're getting treated for cancer. So long and short is there's a number of very nice evidence-based guidelines out there to help guide practicing oncologists and people that are dealing with at-risk patients in counseling their patients. Jennifer, brilliant. Can I just ask you, just as a follow-up, for your normal individuals, are there just zip points that you make to each one other than smoking cessation, obesity, and sunlight exposure? So yeah, so regular engagement in physical activity uh, we really recommend both aerobic activity and as people age, especially some resistance training to help maintain muscle mass. 
Um, I'm not certain what the international guidelines are, but in the United States, there's a recommendation for 150 minutes of aerobic activity each week, plus two strength training sessions. So we definitely recommend that. Diet is trickier, and I think anybody on this uh, part of this conference that deals with diet recognizes how difficult it can be to study and to really counsel people. We do recommend that individuals try to stay away from processed foods to kind of favor whole grains, lean meats, if people eat meat and lots of fruits and vegetables, and to limit alcohol intake. Perfect. Thank you so much. Guido, just quickly, you've given a stunning talk on autophagy but I don't think you mentioned mTOR or rapamycin once, and they're almost synonymous in PubMed. Could you make say a couple of words? Yes, of course. Uh, so uh, rapamycin and the so-called rapalogs, uh, so chemical small molecules uh, that uh, inhibit uh, uh, the mTOR1 complex uh, uh, are inducing autophagy, they're very potent. Uh, it is not the only way to induce autophagy, it's one of the pathways, it, and because mTORC1 is one of the biosensors that controls autophagy, there are others. And uh, it is uh, well known from uh, mouse studies that uh, uh, mTORC1 inhibition by rapamycin uh, induces autophagy, and that this induction of autophagy is required for the lifespan extending effects in fruit flies, in C. elegans, and in yeast. It is not that clear for mice because you cannot inactivate the autophagy pathway completely without uh, causing a progeroid phenotype. So uh, it is known from organ-specific knockouts in mice that the cytoprotective action of uh, mTORC1 inhibition by rapamycin, for instance, on the heart or the liver or the kidney, depends on the induction of autophagy. So it appears a very similar mode of action. Absolutely superb. So one extremely quick question for both of you, which is that we have smoking, obesity, sunlight exposure, and yet so many people are disregarding this. How can we implement this globally? Should this be WHO? Should it be governments? What's the barrier here in implementing these? Well, uh, I think it's a, um, a little bit about public education. It's also about fiscal policy. So uh, you can reduce uh, uh, alcohol and uh, cigarette consumption by uh, increasing taxes on these goods. Uh, and you can also do the same for what we call uh, carbotoxicity. So uh, the obesity pandemics is uh, mostly due to the excessive consumption of re refined sugars, but also carbohydrates in general, and putting taxes on sugar, which is right now the most, the cheapest source of excessive uh, uh, calories, uh, would be a way to balance uh, uh, the strategy of nutrition, even of the poor people, to uh, other uh, sources of calories that are perhaps uh, more recommendable. Brilliant. I, I can't remember if it was the UK or the US that implemented a tax on large Pepsis and Cokes. Mm. But anyway, that uh, it, it was the thin end of the wedge, just the beginning. Jennifer, any comments? No, I completely agree. I think this has to be a policy-driven change. Um, I think that we have some great struggles with that in the U.S. I, there are some lovely models from Europe where they have attempted to put taxes on different, uh, different types of high-calorie, low-nutritional value uh, foods. It is very complicated, obviously, but I think that's the only way that we're going to be able to implement these types of changes. Jennifer, great. I think we've got, uh, what is it, one more minute left, Sam? Uh, minute. Any burning questions from you or the outside panel? Brian, I'm looking at, we have a, a number of questions, half a dozen questions. I apologize for the fact we don't have time to hit them all. We will try to ask our panelists if they're willing to give brief answers written to the questions that are not answered in these sessions, and we'll post them later. So we'll try to follow through on them. There's one question here, maybe there's a quick yes or no answer. Ada Weinstock asks, is there a differential effect of immuno immunotherapy on obese individuals compared to lean, and is that altered with weight loss? So, yeah, 
Yes, uh, so it, it, it actually depends on the cancer. So for melanoma, it is paradoxical to see that obese people respond better to PD-1s blockade than lean people. And this is a, a, a long debate in the field. Uh, uh, maybe the disease that develops in uh, obese people uh, is immunologically different. So it's not the same melanoma that will be developed in lean, lean people and hence uh, uh, less immunoselected and more susceptible initially to uh, the effect of immunotherapy. For other cancers, uh, uh, it is mostly uh, a worse prognosis. Uh, when you uh, look at liver cancer or colorectal cancer, there's no advantage to be obese uh, when you get immunotherapy. Jennifer, I apologize. I know that you have an answer for it, but uh, we are uh, reached the time limit for the cancer panel. I want to thank Brian and the panelists for a terrific session on cancer. Uh, May I just to... thank my eminent speakers in the panel? It was a wonderful panel. Brilliant.